Shalom, everyone. We are at the gate of uh, jealousy. Hopefully, we'll finish it today. Rebuke with smile. This is our topic of today. Remember, we talked last time about uh, uh, Pinchas. Pinchas become Eliyahu. Okay. He lived many years. And <coughs> because he was zealous to the words of God, not easy to do at all. Anyways, we, we, we uh, end off uh, talking about, left off talking about um, Moshe, Moses, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, that he killed the Egyptians. The commentaries uh, tell us, the rabbi tells us how he killed them. People, if they make a movie out of it, they say he killed them with stone, with sword. But he didn't kill them with any type of weapon. He actually killed them using very special words, holy words that can take someone's soul out of his body, can cause someone heart attack right on the spot. The very next time that two Jewish people were fighting and Moses came out to, and he asked them, what are you doing? They turned to him and said, are you trying to harm us using words the same way you did to the Egyptians? As it says, you're saying, because he used the powerful word that passes from Abraham Avinu to Yisra, Isaac, and Jacob, all the way to his father Amram and to Moses himself. So Jewish people kept tradition in some forms till they received the Torah a year later. It was actually not a year later, it was uh, 40 years later when he had to flee, he ran to Yitro, he came back at age 80, and I would say 41 years later to receive the Torah, to be more accurate. So words are very powerful. Remember, we talked many times about the power of speech, right? So uh, Moshe Rabbeinu is the one to learn from. We're going to continue today and talk about rebuke. Who has to do rebuke? Who must rebuke? What rebuke is all about? Rebuke is basically saying, telling someone that he's doing wrong. It's not good what you're doing. Uh, you must do A, C, and uh, A, B, C, or so forth and so on. The question is, when do you have to do rebuke? After he did, or when he's about to do a sin? Let's say someone wants someone from your family, some friend, someone you know, that you uh, can influence him, he will listen to you. Can you rebuke him? Or should you? Or, or when you should do it? Before or after the action? What do you think? You might say, after the action, it's going to be too late. Before, I'm not sure. Maybe you won't do it. So let me, let me help you. You have to do it in both ways. If you suspect that he's about to, you can hint. You rebuke with smile. You don't do it before and other people. Number two, you will yourself have to be clean on that thing. You can't ask someone to eat kosher and you yourself don't eat kosher. Okay? You take him aside, you talk to him nicely, you tell him how smart he, am, he is, and that's the reason you're talking to him. You have high expectation from him. I just want you to know that in the book of God, this is not appropriate. I mean, you can do whatever you want. I'm just telling you, it's my duty. He might do it anyway, but at least you rebuked him. He might think about it. He might feel now you took the fun out of the the the, the, the action, mm -hmm. right? So maybe next time we'll avoid doing this. The mitzvah of rebuke stands for all of us, meaning we all obligated to do it. And if you don't rebuke, you'll be accountable, as if you did it yourself. Wow, this is very powerful. Because Hashem will ask you, you had the power to warn him, why didn't you do it? Why didn't you tell him this is wrong? So if you know that even your father is a sinner, your mother, family member, a brother, you must tell them. You have to be nice about it. You don't have to fight. But prepare yourself. Prepare what you're about to say. Mm -hmm. And tell them with nice words, with smile. And, and uh, from Shemaim, heaven, they'll see that you make efforts. You try. God wants your 
intention, who wants your efforts, is not going to pay you only for success. If you try it, it's good enough for God. All right? Next. Okay, let's, let's read it. Behold, I give to him my covenant of peace. I, and it is written in Devarim 117, Do not be afraid of any man. One who fears the Blessed One will give his life for the sanctification of his name, as it is written in Shemot 32, 26. Whoever is for Hashem, let him come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together to him. Right. It says before that, Behold, I give to him my covenant of peace, as we've learned. Uh, and also he says, Do not be afraid of any man. Huh. Today there's people afraid of their own children. They have to ask permission to take the car. Today, yeah, your kids, uh, honey, can I get the car keys from you? Uh, Dad, you can take Uber. Bye. He tell his father to take Uber. The old days, yes, sir, no, sir, may I? Today. We miss, we miss the old fashion of uh, educators and education. It says, should not, do not be afraid of any man. Avram Avinu, he was standing, Avram, Abraham was standing before Nimrod. Nimrod almost conquered the entire world. And he heard there's a troublemaker, named Avram, that claims there's only one God. And he, Nimrod is not God because he played the role of God. He says, what? He brought him and he says, you're claiming that there's one God. And Avram, follow the, do not be afraid for any man. So there's one God. He says, okay. So he's saying, I'm not God. He says, it can be. You're king. But there's one God above all of us. Okay, okay. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to throw you to the furnace and see if your God will save you. Avram Aminu was not afraid to rebuke even the king Nimrod that could chop his head off if he wanted. Abraham Avinu didn't speak with God. That happens many years later. Only when he becomes 75 years old, after claiming many years there is God, he never talked to him. He came to the conclusion, finally conclusion, at the age of 40. At the age of three, he started wondering, who is above us, who is in heaven? Who is in? At the age of 40, it was done, complete. That's what Rambam Manadi says. And then he gathered many people. And this guy, Nimrod the king, says, what is this? This guy has so many people, thousands following in him. All of a sudden, I'm not a god? He started to believe on his own word that he is a god. Because he succeeded in everything he did. So he says, I'm going to throw you to the furnace. The furnace was a big, big, big pit. That they were putting a lot of fire there for three days and three nights. And they were pushing all the uh, regime resistance, right? Or the regime's enemy. It was so hot, they cannot come close. They would push them with sticks. Mm -hmm. Sticks? Uh, you know, they would die, I don't know, within a minute or so. Just the smoke and the air. The, uh, they would suffocate, burn, ashes. And this is how we were able to get rid of hundreds, maybe thousands of people. Very cruel way to kill people by fire. So Avraham Aminu look at him, and look at the furnace, and look at God, and he said, even if you kill me, it won't change the fact. There's one God. Okay, let's see if God will save you. If God won't save you, I believe that there's one God, and there's only one God. And God says from heaven, what he thinks, I'm not going to save him. I'm going to save my only son, the only one that says around the world that I am God. He threw him to the furnace, and this guy is not dying. They're watching from above, and they see he's walking. God created around his body a safe zone, so it's cooling him. Everywhere he walks, the fire, the, 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 the ash of the fire, uh, the heat doesn't hit him. He never saw something like that in his life. He saw a lot of black magic. He saw a lot of witchcraft. Nero saw a lot of things in his life, but this something something like he never saw in his life. He was amazed by it. He was he, he got out. 
after that, Abraham Avinu had more followers, obviously. And he left them alone. He understand that he can't mess with such a guy. We learn from here, one should be, or one should um, be willing to jump to the furnace and not to uh, um, give away the opportunity to rebuke someone. Especially your own children, especially family. You must tell them what they do wrong, even if they don't like to hear it. You know how many complain against the parents when they are in jail? I wish my father will rebuke me. I wish my father would be more strict with me. I wish my father will hit me. I wouldn't be here in jail now. Uh -huh. you know? Sometimes it's too late. Go ahead. And it is written in Bamidbar 25.7, And Pinchas, the son of Elazar, the son of Aaron the priest, saw, and he arose from the midst of the congregation and took a spear in his hand. All who fear Hashem and who are pure of heart are duty-bound to stir up zealousness on behalf of Hashem when they see the hands of the princes and rulers in crime. Our rabbis of blessed memory have said in Bereshit Rabbah 26.5, any breach which is not made by the great is not called a breach, as it is written in Ezra 9.2, and the hands of the princes and the rulers were in this crime first. You know, talking about rebuke, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> talking about rebuke, one day, the brothers of Yosef standing before him, they don't know yet this is Yosef, is the king. He's second to the king, but he's the king. He's ruling Egypt for 80 years. 80 years. He made Egypt an uh, empire. Thank God. Whenever you have Jews and smart Jews, either in business, in kingdom, it's a success. Standing before him, thinking this is not Joseph. All of a sudden, he revealed himself before them, saying, I am Yosef, your brother. Is my father still alive? What the Pasuk says, the Torah says, They could not answer because they got scared. They were in shock. He rebuked them. You thought I'm dead? I am Yosef. Rabbi Eliezer in the Talmud cried every time he got to this verse in the Torah. The student asked him, Rabbi, why are you crying? He said, this guy standing before human being, he rebuked them and they could not answer. What do we do if we stand before Hashem, before the Almighty and he rebuke us? What are we going to say? Before a human being, flesh and blood, you can't say anything. Of course, you won't be able to say anything before God. What do you think? You're going to play games? I wasn't able. I didn't know. Don't tell me. This nonsense. He knows your heart. He knows your intention. He knows what you prefer. On his expense all the time, you find, I had a job, I had this, I had a birthday. I had a... Nonsense. On my expense, it was a game. You wouldn't miss it. It was a flight. You wouldn't miss it. But when it's a Torah lesson or prayer, you find all the time to skip it. What are you going to say then? There is a very interesting story. We talked about rebuke with smile. In 1978 in Israel it was a law a law was formed to support abortion which according to Judaism according to Rav, you know, is very bad it's equal to murder killing if you see videos 
of how they kill the babies with chemicals, with salt. You see the baby struggling, trying to fight. And people has a lot of uh, reasons and excuses why they want to kill the baby. There's many organizations in Israel and around the world that will help whoever wants to give up the baby. They help you through the whole process, they take care of it. You don't have to kill it. They even give you money because it's basically killing. You're killing a soul. As soon as the baby was formed in your body of the woman, the neshama came down. And what you did, you killed the neshama. You kill a soul. The name of the Minister of Justice, it's called Sara Mishpatim, Minister of Justice. Am I said right? Minister of Justice? Secretary of Justice, Minister of Justice. His name, his name was Shmuel Tamir. He was about to support the very next day this law, the law going to pass. That's it. A group of Knesset members asked for a meeting. He was not in the Knesset anymore. He says, okay, come to my house. They called Rabbi Rafael Levin. Rabbi Raphael Levin is the son of Rabbi Arye Levin. Rabbi Arye Levin knew this Shmuel Tamir for many years ago. They knew each other. They thought that his son would be able to influence him, talk to his heart, to give up this abortion, abortion law. They're going to, to his house. It's already late at night. He's already made a decision. Tomorrow is going to support it. It's done deal. So what happened was, they're sitting in his house, and he says why he wants to support, why this, why that. And Rabbi Rafael says, "I want to. Can I tell you something? I want to ask you. I want to tell you a story." He says, "Go ahead. I tell you a story that my father told me, Rabbi Arya, that you knew for many years. Rabbi Arya Levin was a great tzaddik. He was well known. Those who." visit the sick, visit prisoners in prison. It was one of the greatest tzaddikim that the Jewish people ever had in our generation. And he said to him, you know my father. And my father told me that story. One day, a couple from Ramat Gan had a discussion. What the discussion was about. The woman got pregnant. She didn't want they were husband and wife. She didn't want to have the baby. Could not support the baby. They were poor. Whatever the reason they had. And she wanted to go through abortion. Neighbors knew. Just family. They tried to convince them. Nothing helped. So they heard about Rabbi Arye. They called Rabbi Arye. And he says, Rabbi, maybe you'll be able to save the woman and the baby. This is the address. He went back then, they have to take buses, it's a schlep, going from Jerusalem to Ramat Gan, close to Tel Aviv. You remember what Ramat Gan is, right? So he went all the way to Ramat Gan, knock on the door, she opens the door, like seeing Rabbi Ovadia Yosef. Rabbi Levin, Shalom Aleichem, she understands why he came. She let them in. He was sitting in the living room, he didn't say a word, and he just started crying. Rabbi Arya Levin started to cry, and he cries, and he cries. It was so touching moment. She, he didn't need to say anything. At some point, she couldn't hear him crying anymore. He says, Rebbe, I get it. I'm going to keep the pain. He says, God bless you. God will help you. Don't worry. And he left. And they had the baby. And they survived. And you know who's the baby? You yourself. Shmuel Tamir, the Minister of Justice. You are the baby of that couple. Wow. Uh, I mean, this guy was in shock. He, he, he didn't know what to say. He called his mother. She never told him that. And on the phone, she cried and he says, yes, it's a true story. It happened many years ago. I couldn't afford having you. This and this and that. Who told you that? And he says, I have the son of Rabbi Arye that crying his eyes in my house now. Immediately, he changed his mind 180 degree. 
tomorrow is not supporting this law. And ever since in Israel, abortion is forbidden. Sometimes you can rebuke someone without even say a word. Just crying. Just the power of tears can teach someone else a lesson. May Hashem bless us. We'll, be a, we'll have a good year. This, the whole year, year with curses will go away. A new year with blessing will start upon us. On behalf of Ohev Israel Foundation, please go to our website and make your donation to support Torah and support the needies in every way you can. And as I said in the other video, soon we're going to have a recurring paper so we can give it to you and you can do it on a monthly basis. God bless you all. Shalom, shalom.